Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extensions Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. I'm Kathy Savoy, and I'm happy to be joined today by two of my colleagues, Kate McCarty and Laurie Bowen. As you may know, UMaine Extension has a very rich history of providing home food preservation education to the public. We hope that you will enjoy our new webinar format, which replaces our hands-on workshops for the summer of 2020. These webinars are designed to provide you with current USDA recommendations and feature foods that are in season corresponding with our main growing cycle. Today, we're really excited to have a focus on preserving strawberries by freezing and also emphasizing making low sugar jams and jellies. It's exciting to see the first of the harvest of strawberries arriving at our local farm stands and farmers markets. Let's first talk a little bit about some housekeeping. This webinar is set up so that you can hear and see us but rest assured that we cannot hear or see you. We will, however, have time for your questions um, and they are timed throughout our presentation, but you can enter a question into the Q&A box at any time throughout our webinar. And that can be entered in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we want to remind you to use the Q&A feature, not the chat box. So thanks so much for joining us and let's get started. Kate? So we are so excited for strawberry season here in Maine. It's one of the first summer crops and we look forward to these delicious ripe local strawberries every year. Due to COVID-19, sourcing your strawberries in Maine might look a little different this year. And so we've put together a list of things to think about as we head into pick your own season. So first up, Plan ahead. You'll want to check out the website or social media pages of your favorite Pick Your Own Farm for their new policies this season. You might need to call ahead to schedule a reservation and you should definitely plan to bring a mask. And then as with everything, you should self-screen before heading to the field and don't go if you are feeling sick. And then once you're there, please pay attention to the signage and respect the rules. So farms will be enforcing social distancing measures so be sure to follow their directions related to where to pick in order to maintain that distancing. Other signs you might see may be related to requiring hand washing or not eating in the field or even waiting in your vehicle until there's space for you to pick. And then finally, pick alone wherever possible. We of course understand that picking berries is a summer tradition many Mainers share with friends and loved ones, but coming in groups reduces the number of customers a far farm can serve at one time and therefore increases the risk for all. So picking with efficiency in mind will be the best way to ensure mutual safety for your family and the farm, as well as to support their farmer. And it's also the quickest way to get home to wash, prepare, and eat your delicious berries. So to help you find your local pick your own strawberry farms and farm stands in Maine, our University of Maine agriculture colleagues have created a great interactive directory of Maine farm products so that you can shop directly at farms. And of course, we'll be sure to add this resource in the follow-up email that you'll be receiving after today's webinar. So before we get into the demonstrations, we want your help with a poll. So we wanna know, where do you plan to pick your berries this year? And you can check as many of these options as you want. So do you grow your own or, or get them from someone else's garden? Do you head to the farm stand, the farmer's market, a CSA share, or the pick your own farm? Thanks everyone for weighing in. We'll review the answers in a few seconds. Okay, looks like the majority of you like to head to the pick your own farm which is great. I love it too. So that, um, you know, check out how things have changed due to COVID-19. Um, farm stand looks like it's the next most popular source for your fruit. So thank you for giving us your, your feedback. Okay, so once you've gotten your strawberries, now what? We're going to start with freezing. 
it's the quickest way to preserve those ripe berries once you've picked a lot all at once. So select berries for freezing that are fully ripe and firm and have a nice deep red color. And then you want to wash the berries and remove the caps. So this strawberry huller tool really helps um, to make that a cinch, but you could always use a small paring knife as well. So scoop out all the hulls on your fruit. And you can have your larger pieces, like some berries are pretty big, you could cut them in half or slice them up. Really depends on how you plan to use them um, after you've frozen them. And then decide if you want to add any sugar before you're freezing. So I freeze my fruit without sugar, which is known as a dry pack, and then add the sugar as needed when baking or cooking. If you want to um, tray freeze your fruit, you'll spread the washed berries and either halved or sliced if you want out on a baking sheet that will make sure it fits in your freezer. Um, covered in either parchment, a silicone mat, or wax paper, or freezer paper like I have here. And then this makes the, it so the fruit is easier to remove, otherwise it will freeze to the tray and you'll be really sorry because it'll be a pain to remove. Uh, freeze the tray overnight and then you can come back and package it up in a freezer grade container. And so I've got just the zip top bags here, nice and simple. Um, package the cut fruit or whole fruit into the bag. Um, make sure you remove all the air, seal the bag. I've got the label and date there, June 2020, and leave a little bit of room for your fruit to expand. You could also choose to cover the fruit with a simple syrup or sugar. Uh, sugar helps to preserve the color and flavor of your strawberries, but doesn't do anything for the safety, so you can also leave it out. And freezer jam is another great way to preserve the fresh taste of strawberries without heating up the kitchen. So this jam doesn't require any cooking, which means the fresh flavor of the berries really shines through into the final product. It's also great for working with kids since it doesn't require any cooking. So to make a no-cook freezer jam, look for a pectin that is specifically made for the freezer. So this, the pectin I'm gonna be demonstrating with today is made by the Ball brand. It's freezer pectin. Um, I would say it's widely available, but you might have to hunt a little bit for the specific freezer variety of the pectin. So again, this is the no-cook pectin. Um, and you're going to want to follow the recipe that comes with the packaging. So each pectin has a slightly different process. So to start uh, your freezer jam with this ball pectin, um, you're going to begin by washing your fruit. Again, the recipe is, it comes with the pectin package. So for this specific recipe, it's one and two thirds cups of strawberries, which will make you two eight ounce jars. And then you can double and scale up that batch as needed, depending on how many strawberries you have or how much jam you want to end up with. So I started by washing, hulling, and mashing the strawberries to give me one and two thirds cups of strawberries. For reference, this was not quite a quart of strawberries. And then you'll stir together the sugar and the pectin. So this is two thirds a cup of sugar and two tablespoons of the pectin powder. So you stir these together so that the pectin powder dissolves nicely into your jam and doesn't clump up. If you skip this step and add the pectin powder directly to the fruit, it will give you these uh, unpleasant globs of pectin throughout your jam. So stir this together well and then add it to your fruit. And then you want to stir this together really well, incorporate the sugar pectin mixture together. And then this is the part that's great if you have kids helping because you're, you need to stir the, sh the jam for three minutes constantly. So start stirring and set a timer. Once three minutes has expired, you've made your freezer jam. So I'm going to spare you all the three minutes of stirring there. <laughs> 
And then you'll ladle this jam into clean freezer jars and let it stand for 30 minutes. That's to allow the pectin to set. Um, you can use an, the eight ounce freezer containers that are made specifically for freezer jam that have a nice little snap on lid. Um, but really you can use any kind of freezer grade plastic container that you have on hand. This is a, a smaller, maybe four ounce container. Um, or you can use the glass eight or four ounce jars and use even the metal two part canning lid. Just leave a little bit of space at the top to allow for that jam to expand. And then you can enjoy your jam. If you made a small batch like I did, you might be able to eat it within two weeks if you refrigerate it. Otherwise you could freeze one and enjoy one. Um, but any of your freezer jam should be consumed within a year for best quality. So that's it, freezer jam is a cinch. You can see why it's so popular. Um, really gives you that nice fresh flavor. One thing you will notice about freezer jam though is the finished product um, will have this bright strawberry color that is maintained as well as a looser set than the um, cooked strawberry jam equivalent. And that's because the freezer um, can break down the pectin a little bit. It behaves differently than a cooked jam. So you'll notice that the jam might be a little bit looser than, than a cooked strawberry jam. All right, Lori, let's turn to the Q&A box and see what people are wondering about. Okay. Our first question is, could you please show the non-cook um, brand again, please? Oh, sure. So it is, let me get you real close to my camera, ball, freezer pectin, really check the label. We've noticed that Ball has been switching up the branding on these jars. Um, and I myself have bought the wrong one because I just grabbed the color, which is now a different type of pectin. So really make sure that it says freezer pectin um, because that's the no cook version. Okay. Our next question is, I have several boxes of regular pectin on hand. Can I use regular pectin for freezer jam? That's a great question. And yes, you can. So you'll just like um, the pectin I showed you today, follow the instructions that come in the, the package. And then when you finish the recipe, you'll proceed the same I showed you where you put it in freezer grade, either glass or plastic containers and freeze it. So typically you might, well, I won't say typically, but you might go on to can it at that point. Um, but you could also just choose to freeze it instead. The next question is, can you make freezer jam without pectin if one doesn't mind a looser set? And does pectin have a taste or a flavor? So you can make a no pectin added, uh, what we call traditional cooked uh, full sugar strawberry jam and freeze it instead of can it, yes. And I don't believe that the pectin has any noticeable flavor in and of itself, but I will say that certain brands add sugar to the pectin. And so if you are looking to avoid added sugar for any reason in your jams or jellies, um, double check the label. So they add it to the pectin powder again to keep it from clumping, but some do come with added sugar. So that would add a little flavor. Okay, that's all we have for questions for right now. Okay, keep them coming. So now we're going to go to Kathy and she's going to talk to you all more about um, using low sugar pectins. Great. Thanks, Kate. So again, we're going to switch and focus on some of those cooked low sugar strawberry jam options that exist. Um, typically what we see is that jams and jellies, the recipes have about equal volumes of sugar to fruit ratio. That again would be a traditional kind of high sugar variety that we're talking about. What we've seen in the past several years, and which is uh, fortunate, is that many commercial pectin varieties are now available that offer those lower sugar options. And some are even offering the option to use a sugar substitute, including fruit juice, honey, agave, or the alternative sweeteners like Truvia, and Splenda. So pectin, which you might be wondering, is actually a naturally occurring substance in fruit. As fruit ripens, the pectin content decreases. And the source of our commercial pectins typically is an, an apple 
or some are citrus based. And you can purchase commercial pectins to use when you're making your jams and jellies and preserves at home. These commercial pectins ensure that your product will gel. Because after all, none of us like to have a jam or jelly that simply runs off our toast. These commercial pectin products come in, they do have both full and low sugar versions. And what we encourage people to do is to take time to read the directions that are specific to this pectin product so that they will end up with creating a successful jam or jelly, one that truly does set. So in order to do that, again, take the time to read the directions before you launch into your jam or jelly making adventure. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've received from people who are at home um, and forgot to read the directions on their particular uh, pectin product that said, because some of them do, don't double your batch. So be, be mindful of all the directions that are on the piece of paper that come in the box. Um, and you can find these low sugar pectins at your grocery stores, hardware stores, and natural food stores. In the grocery store, they may be in the seasonal section or they may be in the baking aisle near the sugars. Again, look for boxes that are marked low or no sugar needed on the label. And again, follow those instructions that come in the box and be specific to follow the directions for the type of fruit that you are looking to make jam or jelly out of. What we've put up now on the slideshow is um, a comparison looking at uh, the sugar volume um, to the, in this case, strawberry volume based on the pectin variety. And you can see that there is quite a difference across the board. And what I'd like to point out is that the traditional no added pectin that's shown in the bottom part of the table has eight cups of strawberries to six cups of sugar. I remember the first time I made that recipe thinking, wow, that is a lot of sugar. So I'm always happy to have these alternative pectin types available so that I can choose to use either the lower sugar volumes that are listed here or an alternative. And when it comes to um, being able to make the most choices about your sugar alternatives, we um, look to the Pomona's pectin product which does give um, the preparer a wide variety of different types of sweeteners to use. Um, so what we'd like to do now is to watch a video that covers low sugar jam making. I'm Kathy Savoy, Extension Educator with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Homemade jams and jellies are an all-time favorite for most home canners. Why not try your hand at making a low sugar jam or jelly with one of the many low sugar pectin products that are available on the market today? Your homemade jams and jellies using Maine strawberries and blueberries will taste all the better. Supplies and materials needed to make jam. Colander, paper towels, towels, strawberry huller, cutting board, masher, measuring tools, pots, spatulas, canning tools, standard canning jars with two-piece dome lids, and a boiling water bath. Step one, rinse, hull, mash, and measure strawberries, and measure sugar. Step two, assemble jam or jelly according to the pectin directions. Simply follow the directions provided on the pectin box. Remember that pectin is the product that helps your jam or jelly set. Low sugar jams provide high fruit taste without all that extra added sugar. Some even provide options for using honey, sugar substitutes, or fruit juice. Once done cooking according to the directions in the packet, remember to skim the foam and then fill your sterilized jars. Step three, pack into sterilized jar with the recommended amount of headspace. Headspace is the amount of air between the top of your product and the lid of your jar. For jams and jellies, you want to have a quarter inch of headspace. Screw bands should be tightened to fingertip tight. Step four. Strawberry jam is processed in a boiling water bath for 10 minutes. 
Make sure that the water level in the boiling water bath is at least one to two inches over the tops of the jars. Processing time starts once the water in the boiling water bath has returned to a boil. Jars are placed on a cooling rack to cool. The vacuum seal should form with the classic ping sound within 12 to 24 hours, usually within the first 10 to 15 minutes. Step five, check for seals. A vacuum seal is the ultimate goal for home canners. A vacuum seal prevents air from entering the jar and causing spoilage. Properly sealed jars will be firm to the touch and not make the popping sound of an unsealed jar. Home canned goods need to be stored in a cool 50 to 70 degree space that is dark and dry. A surprise to many people is that home canned goods are stored without the screw band. Simply label, date, rinse off your jars, and use within one year. University of Maine Cooperative Extension is your go-to resource for the latest USDA recommendations for home food preservation. Check out our website for information including workshops, publications, testing services, and more. Great, so I just want to point out that um, home food preservation recommendations do indeed change over time. Uh, you may have noticed that in this video, um, it did not include that newer recommendation to allow your jars to set for five minutes after the processing time is complete. And again, that is to set in the boiling water bath for five minutes after the processing time is complete. Also remember that if your product calls for a 10 minute or longer process time, you are not required to sterilize your jars, but you can if you want to. So over the years, um, a common question with strawberry jam making is how to prevent the separation that occurs. Probably many of you who are experienced strawberry jam makers have seen this layer that's caused when the denser juice of the berries separates from the strawberry solids that float. I just wanna emphasize that this is not a food safety issue. You do not have to be worried about this separation from a food safety standpoint. Um, what I do when this happens to a jar of my strawberry jam is that I simply stir the two layers together when I go to open the jar. Problem solved. And I do want to emphasize that this sort of separation is typical um, when you are using a low sugar or one of our um, products that have a commercial pectin added to them. That's simply because they tend to not be a, um, cooked for a long period of time. And so again, you have the separation between the dense juice and the uh, fruit solids that do float. I want to um, take time to emphasize that there are a few other changes that have occurred in the world of jam making and we want to make sure that you're current in your knowledge before you launch into this year's strawberry jam making. One of those things is inverting your jars or inversion where you turn your jars over for a period of time um, hoping to create a seal. This method is no longer recommended, and that's because it does not create a seal that will stand the test of time and ensure safety. So again, the inversion method or inverting your jars is no longer recommended. Um, another thing that's no longer recommended, and a lot of people are kind of happy to hear this, um, is that wax, also referred to as paraffin, which has um, been used as a sealer in you know, years, years gone by, is in fact no longer recommended because again, it does not create a vacuum seal. Um, so we have the opportunity for molds, yeast, and bacteria to get into your jam product and create problems. So again, no more inverting those jars and no more using wax. Um, and so I want to recommend again that home canned goods should be used in one year. You can see in the slide that we're showing how products can in fact change over time. 
not only does this slide rep show you the separation that can occur in strawberry jam, but what we have here are uh, two jars of jams that are a year apart, and you can see how the color changes do occur over time. So again, we wanna emphasize that you do use your jars, your products within one year. I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate, who's going to lead us through another poll. Yeah, so we're gonna see how closely you paid attention to Kathy's canning segment with the question, proper processing for jams and jellies includes, after filling, invert the jars, hot pack and seal with paraffin, hot pack and process in boiling water bath, any of the above, or I'm not sure. All right, looks like most of you had a chance to weigh in. Thank you so much. And we've got a 100% correct answer of hot pack and process in a boiling water bath. Thank you all for paying such close attention to Kathy. <laughs> Great. Um, so oftentimes, you know, you, you end up having a whole lot of strawberries and perhaps too many to turn into jam. We wanted to share with you a great and refreshing idea for how to use these strawberries. And we wanna thank our UMaine FNEP colleagues for the video. And I'll tell you that uh, that recipe has always been one of my kids favorite summertime treats. Um, so you can find more recipes from our FNEP colleagues by uh, following their mainly dish by looking at their mainly dish videos and following them on Facebook or Instagram or check out their website. So let's take a minute to look at some of the answer some of the questions that are in our Q&A box. Lori? We have some awesome questions. The first one is, what happens if it doesn't make the popping sound after you put it in the water bath? Can you save it or just enjoy it on some toast? So this, this does happen uh, when you, you know, know that you don't have a vacuum seal that has formed on your jar of jam. You are absolutely right, the person who asked this question. You can simply refrigerate that and use it within two weeks. You can also go through the, through the reprocessing, but um, I, I find it much simpler to just refrigerate it and enjoy it within two weeks. This next question kind of goes along with that. If my jam doesn't set, can I recook it? So a jam that hasn't set, can I recook it? Um, you could, but unfortunately, some of the reasons why your jam hasn't set um, could be further complicated through the reprocessing. 
So what I like to do in that case is call it syrup and use it as a sauce or call it sauce even um, and use it on your waffles, on your ice cream sundaes. Um, and that tends to be the easier way um, around that issue. Okay. How do you keep your strawberries from floating to the top of the jar when canning? So I'm assuming this is in a, a jar of jam. So um, again, that, that is a very common thing that occurs when you're using one of our um, commercial pectins because the cooking time for those products, whether they're a low sugar variety or the full strength as we call them, the cooking time is, is pretty short. And so you don't have um, enough heat applied to those products to really force out all of the air that's in those fibrous solids of the strawberry. So it is again, very common. Um, in my experience, when I make the traditional strawberry jams, which again, don't have the added pectin and have to be cooked at, uh, for about 40 minutes and have to reach a certain temperature, so that I know that the gel will set. Um, those are the ones that have been cooked long enough to force the air out to really have a nice, um, a, a nice end product that doesn't have the separation that occurs. But again, it's simply a visual issue. It is not a food safety issue. And you certainly benefit from if you've used a lower sugar option to have less sugar in your diet. Is the process similar with other berries like blueberries? For jam making? It's, uh, I'm gonna assume we're talking <laughs> jam. Yeah. We'll go okay, with we'll, that. Okay, we'll roll with that. Yeah. Um, the answer is yes. And each of these commercial pectin products come with a um, set of directions that have most of, of the commonly jammed or jellied fruit products recipes for each and every one of those included. Um, so you can find thing, you know, recipes for blueberry jam, raspberry jam, jellies, um, and they're all listed in there as well as the directions for how to combine the pectin with the sugar and the fruit and how long you need to cook the product for before processing. Okay, we have just a couple more. Okay. Do, you, do you have to mash the strawberries or you, or can you leave some strawberries more fully intact? I like the big chunks in the jam. Yeah. Um, so the directions call for mashing. Typically that's what the language is used. So you can mash them um, based on your, your preference. Um, we do encourage you to do some, you know, to get it to a point where the juices are being extracted from the fruit. Um, but you, you know, you do have a little bit of ver variability there as far as if it's a super mashed or just kind of lightly mashed. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Great. I, I have old cookbooks with jam recipes that do call for turning the jars upside down. How can I make these recipes safe? So I, I think a lot of us have some old cookbooks floating around in our kitchen, and it is important to make sure to be following the most current recommendations when we're talking about home food preservation, because there is the safety issue that's involved with uh, preserving foods, trying to make something that's a perishable food shelf stable. So I would encourage you to um, get more current information and you as a uh, participant in our webinar will be receiving our current information um, from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension in an email after this um, webinar is over. So you will find information on canning strawberries. And again, if you do use one of these commercial pectin products, you will find current information uh, including how long to process uh, a product in a boiling water bath instead of inverting the jars, which is no longer recommended. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I think that's about all we have time for right now. Maybe at the end, we can squeeze a couple more in. Great. 
So I, I did already mention this and, and here's the slide that's showing you what you will be receiving after this webinar as far as our recommended resources. And they include our Let's Preserve Strawberries publication, Let's Preserve Jams and Jellies and Spreads, Again, a link to that delicious, and again, one of my family favorites, uh, mainly dish frozen strawberry sandwich video. And additionally, there are a few other resources, including um, our general extension publications and the National Center for Home Food Preservation, the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning, and the Ball Blue Book. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Thanks. So I want to tell you about our new Preserving Coach program. This is something we kicked off in conjunction with our webinars, and it's an opportunity for Maine residents to be paired with a trained master food preserver volunteer who can offer preserving advice throughout the growing season. So our master food preserver volunteers are trained in all aspects of home food preservation, and then they volunteer in the community teaching and they obviously have some uh, free time due to the, all the loss of community events this season. So we're hoping that we can pair you up with one uh, to offer some preserving advice. And you can become enrolled in the program by emailing me. I'm also going to be sending you that follow-up email so you can reply directly to me there. Um, and I'll connect you with a volunteer that can provide advice by phone, email, or maybe even in person later in the year. We do have a small group of volunteers, so we'll do our best to meet the demand. We just had our first uh, person respond and be paired with a volunteer last week, so we still have plenty of volunteers available and interested. This is for Maine residents, so if you live in Maine and are interested in being paired with a preserving coach, you can send me an email. And we'll be back next Tuesday at 2 p.m. to discuss preserving herbs. Other upcoming topics include making drinks from the garden and then canning and fermenting cucumber pickles. In the email that you'll receive after our webinar, you'll have these upcoming registrations as well as resources and recipes from today's topic and that information on how to be prepared with a preserving coach. We'll also share a link to our Qualtrics evaluation and a certificate of completion for you. If you provide us with your US mailing address, we'll send you a free headspace measuring tool, which you'll need when canning strawberry jam after you complete the evaluation. And Lori, it looks like we do have time for the rest of those questions in the Q&A box. Excellent, because we just have two more questions. Uh, the first one is, when you say a traditional jam, are you referring to no sugar? Thanks, Lori. And sorry if I created any confusion with that. Um, when I say traditional jam, I'm referring to the jam that you would cook for a long period of time that typically the recipe is eight cups of strawberries to six cups of sugar. So no, no indeed, that is not a low sugar um, jam. And it also, it doesn't have the added commercial pectin to it. That's why I call it traditional jam. Okay, and our last question is, won't using fruit juice as a sweetener cause the end jam to be runny? Well, that's a great question. And you, you might think that because you're adding a liquid in place of a dry sugar product. But in fact, that's what the job of the commercial pectin is, is to um, create a, it's a thickener, so when it is cooked, it will thicken um, that product. So again, you'll have um, a gel, a set um, that will form when you, you, when you follow the directions for the amount of juice and then um, the cooking directions. Okay, I'm gonna sneak one more question in. Um, this question is, I would like to know the difference between sugar and pectin. Okay, so sugar is a sweetener. Um, and, you know, when you look at what it does in the recipe beyond providing a sense of sweetness, it does actually help to um, lock up the water, the available water from the fruit product. Um, so it's, it is doing a couple of things in a jar of jam or jelly. Um, but the pectin 
is is different and i want to you know restate something that i said previously which is pectin is in fact a naturally occurring product in our fruit it's what um, you know provides the the structure to a piece of of fruit um, so when we have a commercial pectin that we use in making jams or jelly um, it is either a, in a liquid or a powder form and when it is um, prepared according to the directions it is the thickener in the jam or jelly so it is what creates um, your fruit product to be able to have that properties that you would expect of a jam or jelly meaning it would hold itself onto a spoon um, versus be runny like a syrup or a sauce. That's all we have for questions. Okay. So we, we wish you luck as you head out into the world of Maine strawberries and start your um, looking at what is, what is the best recipe that I wanna follow, what is the best box of pectin that I choose to use to make my product a low sugar variety. Um, so we thank you for joining us today and I'll ask if Kate has anything else to add. Oh, that's it. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you back here next week for preserving herbs. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.